The Green America Hometown Tour is brought to you by Atrion IT Technology, Rhode Island College, Cardi's Furniture, and the Arpin Group. I'm Peter Arpin for Renewable Now. And as you know, we did four great shows with Scott Wolf and John Flaherty from the Providence Convention Center leading up to their Power of Place Summit. Those shows brought together some of the very best minds in Rhode Island as they plan out a smart future for this small, struggling state. Today, we will give you an inside look at parts of the Power of Place Summit itself. Our show barely touches on the many great, inspiring speakers, presentations, workshops, interactive panels, and experts, over 500 in total, who graced this biennial event. We hope you get a good sense of the overriding message delivered to the overflowing crowd that day that showed clearly how we, all of us, can leverage the state's natural resources and the core infrastructure to a strong, dynamic, diverse economy that will carry Rhode Island for centuries and across many generations. Stay tuned to get a peek inside the Power of Play Summit from Providence, Rhode Island, part one of our three-part special covering the summit. privilege of working with groups uh, at the state level like GrowSmart all around the country and let me tell you and uh, you know hopefully this video won't get back to the other groups but you have you know one of the best if not the best group here in Rhode Island. Uh, Scott's work and the work of all his colleagues at GrowSmart is just right on the mark. Um, my degree is, uh, is an environmental one but actually it was, it was resource economics and policy. So I really have always come at this from an economic standpoint. And like Rhode Island, uh, we at the national level absolutely see the economy and fixing our fiscal mess as job one. It's key to everything else. If we can't fix these pieces, uh, everything else gets a lot harder, as you know. So the main focus, I think, really for our, for, for our generation for the next decade needs to be on rebooting our economy and fixing our fiscal situation. And development has a lot to do with that, and I want to talk a little about that today. We're actually a little confused about even some very basic level pieces of development, like how we as people interact with the stuff we build. Uh, so it's, so it's uh, you know, here exactly what we're going to do when we get to that pole. If we're in a wheelchair, it's hard to say. Here we see, uh, you know, this is probably meant for you to go and visit a tree somewhere. Uh, you know, that's obviously a big destination for a lot of folks. People are averse to looking silly, and so while this sidewalk gets you up the hill, no one will walk on it. I would walk in the street sooner than walk up that sidewalk. <laughs> you know, using the escalator to go to the gym where you're going to get on the Stairmaster and being unwilling to walk up the stairs to get there, it's a little uh, confusing, and of course, the, uh, <clears throat> the daily dog walk uh, where it's really just the dog that's walking. That's taking that term like very literally. We are just going to walk the dog uh, and make sure that we don't do any of that. So we're a little confused even with some of the basic elements. And it's not surprising then that we're also a little confused about the fiscal side. And uh, you know, given the time frame, there's a ton to say on this, but I wanted to cut to the chase um, because we've got limited time. And, and the, the reality is that a lot of the things that we do that we think are, are going to improve our tax base and improve our fiscal situation actually are working against us. And we need to better understand that. And we need to better understand what is going to help us move into a, a fiscally sustainable situation. So uh, there is a lot of literature out there, but Strong Towns has done some great work recently, and I think it illustrates it very well by taking it down to a very specific project level. So they've done a number of these case studies. Strong Towns is an organization in Minnesota. Um, they've done a number of these case studies. They basically said, let's look at this road where the proposal is for the city to, to take half the cost of the road. The subdivision that it's going to serve will take half the cost. What's the story? Is this, is this a, good, uh, a good deal for the city? And the fact is, if you look at that road, to get essentially the city's cost share back, it's going to take 37 years of taxes. 
that assumes no maintenance, that doesn't account for the water and sewer, it's just the road. And, and the fact is roads don't last that long generally. Uh, so you're creating an upfront cash flow by, by putting the money in and then getting the taxes back a little bit, but creating a long-term problem for the locality. Similarly, this was uh, some higher value waterfront property, same situation. Will the city chip in money to make this, this development happen? And basically, you're looking at one life cycle of the road, again, 25 to 30 years, something like that, costing about $154,000, uh, and in fact, only bringing in revenue of $79,000. That's a problem, and it's going to come back and bite you in the end. So a lot of these exchanges, like this one here, are situations where we get somehow some free money up front in exchange basically for a short-term revenue boost that then incurs long-term costs. And you see this here, the federal government in this case came in and said, we'll make this, this community possible, we'll give a grant for this uh, water and sewer system. And now when the bill is due, it actually takes every household, their entire household income for the year to fix this system. That is not going to happen. That's going to come back to the state or the locality, somebody else is gonna pay this bill. You do that over and over incrementally and you end up with some real problems. So the chickens are now coming home to roost. And, there, and this is, you know, we're seeing this and part of the way um, that this gets, uh, that this plays out is in fact uh, through this cycle of cash payments. So if you look at this as basically an upfront investment and then over here on, the, on, the, on your left, uh, you start to see the cumulative impact of the tax payments that come from those properties. Over time, it starts to look really good, like I've got a lot of money in year 24, but then in year 25 when I have to do major re uh, repair or replacement, uh, all of that surplus turns to deficit. So upfront money looks good, you look flush, everything looks fine, and then bam, there's a big problem. So how have we actually enabled this cycle to go on beyond 25 years? Well, there's a little bit of robbing Peter to pay Paul here. Uh, if I can get a new, a new development in year two that's got, that also brings in cash flow at the start, I can actually use that cash to help pay off some of the other debt. And so if I keep getting a rolling cycle of growth, I can keep using the upfront cash from those to pay back the, the backlog and in, in costs that I have. And the problem is that at some point, uh, all of the, you, you're, you're basically overhang of stuff that needs to be fixed catches up with the growth and the revenue that the growth is providing because none of them make money uh, on the whole and you can't make that up in volume. You know, we lose money on every sale but we make it in, up in volume has never been a good business practice. So, uh, so this is the situation that we face is we try to use that upfront money uh, and, and that's how we've been able to sustain the system so far. We also sustain it by simply not sustaining it by neglecting our infrastructure, by incurring huge deficits in our infrastructure spending and having these giant backlogs essentially of fiscal costs. And you can see here, Rhode Island is not in great shape on this, uh, but you're frankly no exception. Uh, this is absolutely typical in states across the country. You know, the American Society of Civil Engineers regularly gives us a D plus and then a D and most recently a D minus for the state of our transportation infrastructure. This is true not only across uh, across the transportation pieces, but also um, with, uh, with water and other services, the transportation happens to be easier to measure, and I think that's why it gets measured a lot. There is a way out of this, though, and so when, when uh, regions have looked at different growth scenarios, they all turn out the same. Don't worry, you're not actually supposed to be able to read this graph. What you're supposed to see is that everything goes in one direction. When you look at alternate growth scenarios, you always end up saving money on infrastructure by, by growing more, more smart, by being more compact, by making more walkable communities. Every place that's ever done this finds savings. Uh, and every place that ever actually gets around to putting it to a public choice, they usually choose to spend less money. Um, so that's, and that's no exception here in Rhode Island. This was a study done in 1999, uh, a cost of, of uh, development study. And basically you can see they created two scenarios, one focusing some of the growth, and it's important to remember this isn't shifting everything in an entire new, entirely new model, this is just shifting some of the growth to the core and finding out what is that impact in terms of the fiscal uh, cost of infrastructure. And then also, and so you can see, you know, we're looking at uh, a net savings over 30 years of about $242 million. 
that also has annual implications in terms of, uh, in terms of infrastructure maintenance costs, and there are sa savings as, as well there. So capital and maintenance both uh, end up looking a lot better when you can be more compact and focus more of your development on places that already have the infrastructure. Um, and this is what we see. This is uh, from, from California. It's the same everywhere. I just picked uh, illustrations that I thought were, were clear. You know, the, the urban infill sites, when you take advantage of the infrastructure you already have, are going to be costing you less to build. Um, and there, you know, there are some, there are some uh, sort of permutations to that that are interesting that I'll get into in a moment. On the flip side, we're actually not very good at taking actions that would actually build our tax base. And in part, this is because it's the flip side of the, of the previous equation. The things that we like to do bring us cash up front and put the costs out in the future. The things that we need to do to turn that on its head sometimes require cash up front and then create a revenue stream that's sustainable and will more than cover its cost to create surpluses that we can use to support other things. So here we've got uh, the revenues per acre. Same study from California, you match that up with lower infrastructure costs, higher revenues per acre, and you start to see something that might work out because obviously our fisc fiscal situation is both the costs and the revenue side. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, a case study of this that I think is really illustrative. And again, there's a lot of this kind of work out there, but it tends to be at the more macro level. This is a very specific case that I think just really illustrates it done by uh, Joe Minicozzi and Public Interest Project. And this was done for Sarasota, Florida. And so they looked at the, uh, the revenues generated by different development forms. And in this one, they looked at basically uh, residential in different locations. The, uh, the city residential there is single family. And you can see that the city residential outperforms uh, both the suburban uh, multifamily as well as the suburban single family in terms of revenue. When you start to bring commercial in, which we start to, you know, that's what we try to use to make up for some of the gaps in residential, you can see that the city residential on a per acre basis is about the same as a Walmart in their suburban areas in Sarasota. Uh, you can start to get some better uh, revenue creation from uh, some of their other malls. The Southgate Mall is kind of their premier mall in Sar Sarasota, high-end uh, shopping, the kind of place that a lot of places really see as kind of the, the brass ring for uh, economic development and drawing, uh, and drawing development. This is a picture of the Southgate Mall, 32 acres, uh, valued at basically $58 million. Um, the acreage and the, the revenue per acre is important, of course, because uh, the amount of acreage also determines how much infrastructure you need to actually service it. The thing is, when you then add in urban forms, you have to change the scale of the, of the graphic because the revenues generated uh, in urban areas by much, much more compact development are a lot higher than those suburban examples. So uh, here you've, at the top, you've got basically a high rise mixed use, then the next line down is mid rise, and then the lowest, uh, the lowest green line is uh, kind of three story, low rise urban development, mixed use development. And you can see that all of those greatly outpace uh, any of their suburban counterparts. So that's important. So you've got uh, one acre, basically, that you have to serve with infrastructure valued here at $65 million. Uh, and that compares rather favorably with having to service a much larger area and having less revenue uh, generated. And so you can see uh, that that 1.9 acres in Sarasota actually generates more revenue than the 109 acres of mixed use suburban form out at the edge. Uh, so much higher revenue, uh, a lot less area to serve, taking advantage of existing infrastructure. You may need to put in as both uh, the public sector or the private sector some upfront costs to make this happen, but then the generation of revenue sustains itself over time. We need to figure out how to bring some of that value up front to make up for that cost difference. This is, um, this is demonstrating that when you <coughs> uh, take that one acre and combine Southgate and Walmart, uh, you actually end up still with, uh, with higher revenues. And in fact, if you want to look at uh, the way we started to, which is how long does it take for this property to pay itself off, you're going to have a return on the infrastructure money you invested in three years for the urban project and about, uh, I'm sorry, that's the next slide, 35% return on your investment versus 2%, which translates into a three-year payback versus a 42-year payback. 
So pretty substantial differences. Again, the likelihood of that, of that mall uh, infrastructure lasting the 42 years you need to make it work uh, is pretty low. And you're going to have to do some redevelopment and some resurfacing and some maintenance and other things. So you know, whether that's sustainable over the long term is a big question. This is certain, certainly generating a lot of revenue. Um, it's also true, though, if you're not you know, looking for a 12-story for a building or a 14-story building, it's true of the three-story buildings. It's true that a lot of, you know, we, we've done technical assistance with a number of towns, and often one of the first things we ask them to do is just go do this calculation. Take any parcels in your, in your district and ask the question, how much revenue am I getting off of that per acre versus others? And a lot of places find that their old downtown that they view as shabby and run down with stores that seem to be sort of on their last legs from a revenue standpoint are some of their top revenue getters even so. Despite that situation, uh, they are still some of their top revenue getters. And so it starts to inform us about if we're going to be investing as a public entity about where we're actually going to get a return, since all of these projects tend to be enabled by some sort of public uh, subsidy, this should inform where we go. But it's, it's actually the case, and this has been surprising, uh, unlike a company who knows where their revenue centers are and where their cost centers are, cities and counties tend not to know that and certainly tend not to know this specific piece of it about the relative contribution of different development types. Instead, anything is looked at as that's just adding to tax base and that's just not the case. Um, we also, of course, have examples of this in Rhode Island where you've, where you've taken individual buildings, you've taken them from a from an assessed value before of 213,000, brought them up to 2 million, increased the taxes uh, received from 7,000 to 39,000. Uh, it works here in Rhode Island. It works everywhere. There are other examples of that in, in Pawtucket. You know, these are pro projects that you're probably more familiar with than I am. But all of these are generating a positive revenue return over time, over a sustained period of time. They probably all need an upfront investment. We've got to figure out, again, the tools to prosperity that enable us to create these long-term revenue streams. Um, <clears throat> when we don't, when we don't pursue this, we end up with problems, problems in a number of ways. And this is, uh, I, I hate to pick on Cleveland, because I like Cleveland, uh, but Cleveland has, uh, has some issues that they've got to figure out. Cleveland's population uh, in 1950 was about 1.4 million. Their population in 2002 was about 1.4 million. They took that population during those uh, 60 years or so, uh, 50 years, and spread it out quite a bit. You can see the difference in the development patterns there. And part of what they had to do was add a number of lane miles. So in, just in terms of their major roads and arterials, they basically went from 2,400 to 4,400 major freeway and arterial miles. Uh, an, urban <coughs> an urban arterial, four-lane road, FHWA, Federal Highways folks, basically say you're looking at 20 to 80 million dollars per lane mile. So if we take conservatively the 20 million per lane mile and multiply that over the 2,000, you're looking at 40 billion dollars. Uh, you've still got 1.4 million people. Those folks now have to support all that extra infrastructure. That doesn't count any of the local roads, that doesn't count any of the sewer, that's just a lot more infrastructure to support. And surprisingly, or not at all, uh, this has become a problem, and they have real fiscal, fiscal issues. And then you add on the age component that we talked about earlier, and you can see why taxes have to go up in the older places, because you start to have, you start to, have to pay the piper. Uh, in the newer places, you're earlier in that cycle, and so we create this pattern of everyone continuing to flee to the newer places, uh, when in fact we're just increasing our overall burden uh, time and again. And you can also understand from that why when the growth machine stops, and we no longer have access to the revenues that we were taking from Peter to pay Paul, suddenly it gets a lot worse. Suddenly it gets a lot worse. And that's what we've seen, of course, over the last uh, couple of years, is that the growth machine essentially stopped, those revenues disappeared, and now every conversation is about, do we cut services, raise taxes, or both? And this is part of the reason why. You don't have to go in that direction. Arlington County, Virginia. They went in the opposite direction. They, they recognized some of these fiscal realities. They said, we want to make major investments in our downtown core. This, this is the roslyn Boston corridor. Actually, I want to go back for a second. I'm sorry, because there, uh, there, is, there is another piece of this that, that's worth noting. 
you might say, well, maybe it was worth it for other reasons to do this. Maybe it's a lot more expensive. It certainly wasn't from a transportation perspective. I just want to point this out, that in 1982, they had basically 10% of their vehicle miles of travel, 10% of their travel was, took place in congested conditions. In 2007, 28%. They used to have three hours of rush hour, now they have five hours of rush hour. They used to have 10% of their lane miles in congestion, now 23%. Every traffic measure got worse. By spreading people out, adding a bunch of cost, it's not working. So what is the alternative? It is the kind of thing that Arlington did. This doesn't have to take place all over the county. This is basically 7% uh, of the county's land mass. So we're not talking about changing everything. This is 7%. It generates one third of their revenue for exactly the reasons we just discussed. So this is a big money maker that actually enables a lot of the other parts of the county to go on being money losers. There's a cross subsidy going on here uh, that, that, and enables one of the lowest tax rates in the entire DC metro area. And it's hugely successful. And, they've, and actually traffic right here has fallen in that corridor, despite adding uh, 15 million square feet of office, 15,000 units of residential. So that's the fiscal side. There's also the economic component, how we get growth going again. And there are some key things, and Scott started to touch on them, uh, that I just wanted to bring up. And that is young professionals. A lot of places are dealing with brain drain. Uh, and, and it's absolutely true that people are uh, seeking places to live first, acting on the power of place, essentially, and then saying, well, what can I do once I'm there? So this was the case in 2010 in the, 20, in the census. This has continued to be the case from all indicators, even through this recession. People want to go to a place, and then they figure out what to do there. So they're drawn by these, you know, and this is exactly the workforce that a lot of these companies are looking for. We're not competing anymore at being at the intersection of rivers. We're competing on where is the talent. So that's, the, that's how the economy has changed. So um, Gallup did an extensive poll. These are the kinds of, of uh, attractions that people are looking for that attach them to place, that attract them to place. Uh, you know, it's the social offerings. It's the welcome. Uh, nature of the culture there, it is the physical beauty, uh, all of those things uh, uh, attract people to place. Places without it are having a tough time. This Michigan CEO basically says, there isn't a here here, uh, and I can't get anyone to move here because of that very thing. Uh, I can't recruit the workers I need, they are not here, if they are here, they're leaving, uh, and it's creating a big problem for them. Oklahoma City, in, in the 1990s, Oklahoma City was competing for a firm and had, uh, you know, equal if not a better set of tax incentives on the table to get a, you know, a big company to land a big fish. They lost it. They lost it because of quality of life. That changed the track they're on where the mayor now, the Republican mayor of Oklahoma City, is basically saying, look, we've got to improve the quality of our place. That's what's going to drive our economy. And in fact, since they've embarked on that, they have stopped population loss and brought in a number of new companies downtown, and it's working for them. Their tax revenues are growing, uh, and their fiscal situation is improving, and their economic engine is improving. Um, you know, these are the kinds of places that these companies are moving. They're looking for the, you know, the downtown, walkable, transit-oriented places that they can relocate, and we're seeing that in the market. We're seeing people move back to downtown Detroit. You know, and if they'll move there, uh, you know something's going on. Um, yeah, don't tell Detroit I said that either. Actually, downtown Detroit is really kind of cool, kind of funky. Um, so, uh, you know, other evidence of this, walkability. Basically, um, you know, you can use this at a, at a city scale as they are in Oklahoma City. It's also been used in a lot of places at a more uh, Main Street scale. Just making walkability improvements, uh, you know, here in Lodi, California, led to a lot of, uh, a lot of additional businesses, 60 new businesses. Reduced, uh, reduced empty uh, storefronts, uh, increased customers, you know, using that principle, paying attention to the public sector role in creating that place that the private sector wants. Uh, and then we, you know, we focus a lot of our, our attention in economic development on how do I get stuff. Uh, you can also grow it. And it turns out that actually being together, uh, and this shouldn't, you know, given the course of human history, it shouldn't be a surprise, people come together to do stuff. It's those places where people gather that creates that you know, very hard to measure, hard to describe, intangible mix of flow of ideas, of aggregation of capital, of exchange of technologies, 
All those things happen when people come together. It's hard to measure. These are some of the, some of the ways that studies have been able to, uh, to measure those outcomes. Um, you're familiar with the, you know, the phenomena of clustering. This is brought up all the time with, you know, here's Kendall Square. Uh, MIT is a big attractor. Everyone leverages each other. Workers are moving. It's vibrant. There's a lot of intellectual capital. Same is true in Dalton, Georgia with the carpet industry. You know, all those carpet people, they're really excited about the fibers and the backing, and they're just like going crazy talking to one another, moving around between companies. The point is, of course, that this isn't just about the technology sector or about, you know, advanced manufacturing or anything. This is about the basic ways that economies work. And one of the keys to that that I think hasn't been as key in the past but will be in the future is the quality of the place. And you can see this in places like RTP. Research Triangle Park, where they wanted to leverage Duke University, North Carolina State, and UNC, and basically take advantage of all of that natural clustering, pair it with private sector industry and development. They were hugely successful. They have been falling off lately. Part of the reason they're falling off is that when I worked there in 1994, the lunch hour rush, uh, the lunchtime rush hour was horrible. You could not get lunch at any of the office park buildings. You had to get on the road and go to some you know, horrible you know, chain brass rail restaurant, and it took you an hour there and back. It was unacceptable working conditions. Uh, you know, I moved on quickly. Uh, they're finding this. It's creating, it's creating vacancies in their once very successful model, and they're looking to retool now. They're saying, you know, this is basically code for how do I create a place rather than a park. You know, an office park isn't cutting it for these places, so they're looking for ways to really uh, engage people in more interchange and have it be more of a, of, of a town uh, feel and a, and a place where people can interact and be, uh, and, and be excited by the surroundings that they're in. And I'll just uh, cl close on a couple notes. Um, you know, when you think about places, if, if tourism is important, uh, who has thought more about what gets you to come to some place than these guys, right? Nobody. They have dumped millions of dollars trying to figure out how to get you to spend an extra day in Disney World. And so what did they come up with? The classic Main Street. You know, the places that they, you know, without a lot of auto traffic. You've got to leave your car at the door and you've got to walk around this place. That's the kind of places people will visit. That's the kind of places like Burlington, Vermont. You know, I, I find this kind of, kind of striking here, like... <laughs> pretty... Pretty similar there. So, um, you know, if, you, if that's part of your economy, it's got to be, you know, and I will wager 90% of you did one of two things on your last vacation. You went and visited family, or you went somewhere and you walked around. And the place you walked around wasn't a giant parking lot, it wasn't a strip center, it wasn't a power center, it wasn't a suburban subdivision, it was a place. And that made all the difference to whether you wanted to go or not. So I'm going to wrap up there. Uh, you know, a key to this, obviously, is whether the market wants to build this stuff. And that's what I'm going to turn over to my private sector colleague to speak with a lot more authority about what the market wants and what it's been doing. Thank you.